Okay, so welcome eventually um, to this training school on reed belt refinement. Um, I'm going to start off, as I say, with a few talks um, to give you some understanding of why we're here. Uh, so first of all, yeah, we're going to talk about what reed belt is, um, what you need in order to be able to do reed belt. Um, I'll give you some recommended reading if you want to learn more. Excuse me, but what I'm not going to do today um, is talk about any sort of in-depth crystallography. I want to just focus on the software, the process of, of doing a refinement, because uh, that's what you really need to know. The crystallography can come later. Um, and also, we're just going to look at really simple examples today. Um, so some very basic examples, things that I know should work. Um, so hopefully the, the data will take care of itself to some extent. So you're not going to be really confused by um, difficult uh, refinements today. The refinements should be easy. The other thing we're not going to cover today is your samples. Um, everyone comes often with their own data set thing. I want to refine this data today. We're not going to do that. We're going to stick to the examples that I've provided for you, things that I know should work. Um, so you can use the software um, without having to worry about things going wrong too much. Things will go wrong today and there are places in in the process that we go through today where they are deliberately going to go wrong for you and um, so you can learn from that as well. Okay so as I say we've got a mixture of uh, short lectures none of these talks I imagine will be longer than 15 minutes there might be a couple bundled together but they'll all be very short the focus is on hands-on experience getting you guys using the software so that when you walk out the door at the end of the day you'll be ready to start doing refinements on your own refinements on your own samples um, you might need support with that, you know, obviously, but uh, you'll have the basic skills that you need. As I say, if you do need help today, as we're going through the worked examples, just put your hand up. Um, Whitney and I will be here to help you, but also talk to your neighbours as well. Talk to the people around you, because quite often that will be quicker. And especially if you look at the person next to you, and they're further on than you, they might already know the answer to your question. So peer learning will be great as well. We've got a lot to get through today, so... Um, you, you guys are going to have to crack on and, and get stuck in. As I say, by the end of today, uh, you should understand what reed belt refinement is and how it can help you uh, and how it can help you in, in your research problems that you come across in your projects. Uh, you'll know where to find the software, where to get help, support as well. Um, you'll be able to carry out, as I say, at least basic refinements for single and for multi-phase specimens. A lot of people are interested in quantitative phase analysis here. Uh, we'll be able to do that by the end as well as, as just a simple single phase refinement. You'll be able to judge what the software has given you, um, know whether or not it makes sense, um, understand all the statistical outputs that the software gives you, what they mean, when you should listen to them, and you'll have an idea of strategy, the tactics, how to approach a refinement for a, for a given problem. So. Um, hands up if you're on the Echo 360 thing following this through. Great. Awesome. I'm going to start off just to give us an idea, uh, an interactive thing. Uh, there's going to be quite a few of these today. It's one of the advantages. This Echo 360 um, is getting rolled, uh, rolled out across the campus this year. So we're going to be using this in all our lectures next year, or some of them anyway, all of mine. Uh, so what you need to do here, um, when you see a question like this, is just press on the answer that you like um, and then press the submit button that's the thing everyone forgets and these questions were initially were just to help us Whitney and I understand what the level of experience is in the room uh, but later on they'll be to help revisit key topics and, and to help you improve your learning uh, as we go along so we've got 10 submissions so far we'll give it another few seconds also the feedback at the end um, I've got normally give out a feedback form. All the feedback will be done in this software as well. You don't have to wait. You can click on uh, in your slides as well. Uh, if you want, there's another question coming up. Uh, so I'm going to close this now. Someone just snuck in before that. So if we look at the results here. So the question was, how much experience do you have of diffraction techniques? Uh, one person said none. I'm guessing that's Laurie. Yeah. Yeah. Who's just starting his PhD yesterday? Today? Monday, yeah. Monday. okay. So, um, that's a fair comment. <laughs> uh, 
Um, we wouldn't expect you to have too much, but don't worry, I'm going to give you a, a basic overview, hopefully. Uh, a little bit, 11 people, and no experts. Okay. Click on to the next question. Uh, how much experience do you have of Rietveld refinements, Rietveld analysis? You've never heard of it before, none but yourself, but you have heard of it. Uh, you've got some experience, or loads you should be given the class. Uh, which is it? Oh, we've got 16 already, awesome. So, <coughs> okay, so a lot of you have no experience. Um, so, hopefully, today is going to be really, really useful for you. That's not a problem. I don't expect you to have any experience, and I don't think any is required for today. Good. And I know one of you has. He's not on at the moment, so he might not answer this. Have you previously attended this course? <coughs> no, okay. So a lot of people do come back and do this course again, and that's fine. Um, but none of you have, so I, I'll, I know now that I'll need to go through the notes and how things are, are going to work. Because people are often a bit surprised at how this works out. Okay, so let's have a review <coughs> of what diffraction tells us. Let's see if this will work as well. Okay, so this, for Laurie's benefit, is a diffraction pattern. Most of the rest of you will at least have seen one. I'm not sure if Laurie will have even seen one before. Uh, so this is what we get out of an X-ray diffractometer. And that will be very familiar to, to most of you, I would have thought. Uh, so we know already um, that every crystalline phase, every ordered, every, every, everything that has a periodic crystal structure will give its own characteristic diffraction pattern, like a fingerprint, um, with these characteristic Bragg peaks. And these peaks come from reflections of the X-rays off of specific planes of atoms within our crystal structure. Okay. We can then label these peaks with these things we call Miller indices. So we've got 110 coming from this plane of atoms indicated in a cubic unit cell there. Uh, we can imagine having 100 faces and having a peak for that on the, on the plot. So that's fine. That's pretty basic stuff. That's not going to work. Okay, cool. Uh, what does this actually mean, though? Where does all this come from? Well, we can break this down into four separate components, really. First of all, I guess the most obvious thing, the positions of the peaks. Why do we have peaks where they are? Uh, well, these are determined by the size and the shape of the unit cell. So if your lattice parameters change, the peak positions will change. So peak positions purely from the shape and size of the unit cell. How big the peaks are, their intensities, determined by where the atoms are within that unit cell. Um, and also the peaks get more intense as you go to heavier atoms. So if there's a heavier atom that's scattering, your peak will be bigger. Similarly, if we've got more of a phase within a multi-phase specimen, the peak will be bigger. So there's correlations both with what is doing the diffracting and how much of the diffracting thing you have. Okay? And that determines the intensity of the peaks. A uh, very simple level. It's much more complicated than that. Uh, the widths of the peaks, the shapes, tell us a lot of information, particularly about the size, the crystallite size of our sample, and any microstrain effects that we've got within the crystallites in our sample. So peak widths are really important as well. And then finally, we might have oscillations in the background that tell us about short range uh, ordering, short range information about our our material. This is more covered in something called pair distribution function theory. This is not something that many of you will, will probably have done. Um, and that's pretty complicated stuff. In terms of what we're going to do today, we'll pretty much ignore everything that's in the background. But we will cover it a little bit later on. What we all do here is powder diffraction. <coughs> Excuse me. Even if you're looking at a metallic sample, we're still interested <coughs> excuse me, in uh, the grains within that crystalline uh, metallic sample, within that bulk sample. 
In an ideal world, we would be doing single crystal diffraction. Single crystal diffraction gives you a lot more information. And what you get here on the right hand side of this slide shows you, for the same sample, the overlapping data. The blue rings are, I always get this confused, the red, yeah, the blue rings are the data from the powder diffraction, and the red spots are the data from single crystal diffraction experiment. So what you can see is if we obviously if we do diffraction in the lab, we've only taken a two-dimensional slice. So all we do is scan across one part, one line through this powder line. So we get one section of these overlapping blue lines. So with single crystal diffraction, it's really good because we see every reflection from the sample. We see all of the peaks. We get all of the information. And there's no overlap. They're all discreetly separated out. If you've got experience of electron diffraction, you're used to that kind of phenomenon. You see a lot of information. But when we move to powder diffraction, this gets condensed and a lot of these individual spots start to overlap. So for example, indicated here with these black arrows are four discrete separate reflections in the single crystal data. But when we compress that down into two dimensions for the powder pattern, we just see a single peak we see a single line. So we lose a lot of information when we do uh, powder diffraction work. We can't determine the intensities of individual reflections unambiguously in all cases. If we want to understand all this stuff I've just told you about, all the crystal structure information, the crystallite size and all of that, we're going to need to be able to model these peak positions, the peak intensities, the peak shapes really, really well to account for this loss of information that we've got in powder diffraction. Uh, if you want to learn more about that, uh, there's a whole paper here that you can refer to which has this, this diagram in more detail. But the key thing is, how are we going to make sense of that powder diffraction data? You've got, a, you've got the big data set, how are you going to make sense of what it means? And it comes down to a need to model the peak intensities and shapes really, really well. So what, what is Rietveld? Well, this is Hugo Rietveld. He came up with this method. And basically, it's a computational technique for crystal structure refinement that deals with this problem of overlapping intensities. It was developed for use in the diffraction analysis of powder samples. And he came up with it in the late 1960s, 1970, somewhere about there. What is it? Well, Rietveld is a least squares approach to refining a theoretical line profile, a calculated diffraction pattern, until it matches the measured profile, the, the actual collected data. So what do we do? We take a starting theoretical model. So we take a model of a crystal structure or more than one crystal structures. It's a multi-phase sample. From that, we generate a calculated diffraction pattern. So we say, this is what we think the structure might be like. What would the diffraction pattern look like for that? We compare it against our experimental data, what we've collected from our XRD machine. And we see that the two probably don't match very well. And then we allow the structural model to vary in a very controlled manner until that calculated diffraction pattern more closely matches the observed pattern. So we minimize the differences using this least squares approach. The advantage of doing this, it gets rid of this problem of overlapping intensities because you're fundamentally dealing with that in the modeling of the, of the calculated diffraction pattern. So it's a really good way for overcoming that problem. Fundamentally, therefore, it might be obvious, Rietveld is something that's really good for solving crystal structures. So if you've got a new material, you don't know what crystal structure it has, Rietveld is, is the key tool in, in unlocking that puzzle. So for me, and what I do in my research, a lot of times I'm trying to identify the crystal structure of a new phase that I've made. Um, and that's, this is the, the core of my research. This is, this is what I do day to day. But it can do a lot of other things as well. Uh, a lot of you are here for quantitative phase analysis. Um, Rietveld, it, as we'll come to see later, is the best way of quantifying the phases in your sample using XRD data. 
Um, it's really good for phase identification, purely because you know it, if you're just looking at data, it's easy to ignore all the lumps and bumps. But if you're having to actually fit the data and explain all the peaks and the peak intensities and the peak positions, it makes you pay more attention to all those lumps and bumps that you were able to ignore before and, and take account for the full information in your pattern. As I said, we can deal with the size strain analysis as well. And we can also get some idea for dealing with texture with preferred orientation effects as well. One of the key applications that I've not actually put on the list there is also for lattice parameter refining. Um, it's something I don't think I deal with very well on the lab website for data analysis uh, because I'm always planning to get around to putting something like this on there. Um, but when I come to refine my lattice parameters, wheat belt is what I do. I might do a Lebai fit, which we won't talk about too much today, or I might do a full refinement, depending on the situation. But Revelt is a quick and easy way of getting into that lattice parameter information. So that's well worth bearing in mind. And I will remember to put that on the slide for next time. Uh, OK, so what do we do in Revelt? Uh, normally, I have nice animations on this slide, which talk you through it. Uh, so, we need a whole bunch of th things before we can do a refinement. Obviously, we're going to need some software to do the, the calculations in. Uh, but we also need a bunch of things as well. We need to know about our instrument. We need to know how it's set up. Effectively, what a diffraction pattern for an ideal sample would look like from that instrument. And so we have various checks and what we call instrument parameter files for GSAS that we use today. And those tell the software this is what data should look like for this machine. We might do a whole bunch of checks and calibrations on the machine as well to make sure that it's set up right. Once we've got that information, we can then collect our data. Often, obviously, the data collection might come first, but uh, we can collect our data. We may then need to do some corrections some calibrations that we'll talk about in a moment. We'll need to get it into the right format, which we can do quite easily using the software, convex, POW, DLL, things like that. And then once we've got our data into the right format, we can feed all of that experimental information into our Revelt analysis software. So that's the experimental wing, if you like. We've then got the calculated side of the, of the program. So we're going to need crystal structures. And this is obviously, well, it, often this is going to be a big challenge. Of, and it may be that it's really straightforward. But we're going to need to know, or have an idea at least, of what the crystal structure of the materials is, uh, the phases are, is in the material. So there are databases. Obviously, you can look at papers, look at the literature, see what that tells you. Uh, but we need a starting point. We need to know space group, lattice parameters, atomic positions. As I say, you might be able to go to the database. If you're working on a perovskite, there'll be loads of perovskites in there. So you can find something that matches really well and use that as a starting point. Same, you know, there's a lot of my students here today. All of your projects will have my work in the background. So there will be crystal structures there for you to start with. So in that case, if you've got a starting model, it's very straightforward. You can just proceed straight away. That will give you your theoretical structure. If you don't have that, if you're working on something that's never been studied before, um, then this could be the biggest part of your project, coming up with this maybe using ab initio techniques that we're not going to talk about today, um, sort of Fourier analysis, trying to find missing atoms in a crystal structure. This, th th that sort of approach where there isn't that background there for you to draw upon could be the biggest part of your research project. could be a year's work coming up with that. Maybe less these days because computers are a lot faster. But um, coming up with a the theoretical starting point, the theoretical structure is a big, big challenge. Once you've got it, though, you can then feed it into the analysis. And so once you've got your data and your structure in there, we do a refinement. We allow some parameters to vary. And then we feed those refined parameters back in and refine some other parameters or refine them again. And we keep going iteratively until eventually the changes are very minimal, until the things aren't we, we're refining parameters and they're not really changing anymore. The differences in the calculated and the observed data have been minimized. And at that point, we have our final refined crystal structure or structures. So that's the, the basic workflow for, for what we do. You'll see this as we go along in a lot more detail. 
Uh, what do we need? Well, in order to do refill, we're going to need, obviously, some data. So we'll talk about what that means in a minute. Uh, we need good quality data, whatever that means. Uh, we're going to need a computer, obviously. And the software we're going to use today runs on Windows, Mac, and I think Linux as well. We're going to need some software to do the refill refinement. There are three main packages uh, that one might use <coughs> to do a full, proper refill refinement. You might see other things like Jade and Highscore Plus, where people say can do refill. I, I would never touch those. The three that you use would either be GSAS, FullProf, or Topaz. Uh, which one you use depends really on where you come from. Have we got any native Spanish speakers here? Not sure we do. No? If you're from Spain, you'll probably use FullProf, because the guy that wrote that is Spanish. Um, so that's, that's quite a common one. You see a lot of people using that. Um, probably more, as I say, Spain, maybe within the EU uh, as well. FullProf is quite popular. Uh, the one we'll use today is GSAS, um, which is written by an American. So if you speak English, you'll probably use GSAS. Um, GSAS has been around for decades and uh, is very widely used. There is now also GSAS 2, which is being phased in to replace GSAS. Uh, I don't like it yet, so I, I'm not using it, but I need to get to grips with it at some stage. And then there's also Topaz, which is the commercial software that uh, Brooker release. Um, it costs a lot of money for a license for Topaz, about £20,000. So if you work in industry, you might use Topaz. Uh, we'll have a little bit of Topaz later on, um, because we do have Topaz, actually. When we bought the D2, they gave us 10 licenses for Topaz for free, which is quite remarkable. Um, and Topaz is really nice. So that's, that's another option for, for your root belt needs. As I say, we need a starting point. We need some sort of crystal structure to begin. Even if it's not a complete crystal structure, we need a starting point. And we need some chemical common sense to know what is reasonable, um, to be able to judge what the software is telling us. As I say, we're going to be using GSAS today. Even if you go on to your Topaz, I think GSAS is a really good starting point because it makes you think about what you're doing as you're going along. And we're going to be using something called EXP GUI, um, which is a Windows interface. GSAS has been around probably for 20, 30 years and it's a horrible DOS-based program. Um, you have to know the commands to get through all the nests of menus. It's really horrific to use. That's what I learned with. Um, and it used to be literally like, press a button, wait for a minute, press another button, wait for a minute, press another button, wait for a minute, do the refinement, wait for five minutes. We used to be really, really slow. So they came up with this EXP GUI, which is a Windows-based interface. It makes the whole process a lot easier. Plus, um, computers are a lot quicker these days. Um, there's another add-on for it called CMPR. We won't cover it today, um, but you might want to look into that as well. It can be quite a handy thing. Tutorial videos. Um, mo a lot of what I know, well, I'm entirely self-taught on using GSAS. I didn't have any courses. Whitney, I think you're the same. Um, these videos at the APS website are written by uh, Brian Toby. Is that right? Yeah. Brian Toby, who wrote EXP GUI. So he, he kind of hope he knows what he's doing. They're a bit dry, in fairness, but he is the expert at using the software, and they cover the whole range of things you might need to do. So if you are stuck and you want to learn more, I would, I would recommend if, you, well, if you're doing Reefelt, you need to watch those videos. Put aside half a day and watch the videos. Really, really educational. The GSAS manual um, comes with the software. I would say it's possibly worse than useless. Um, it's kind of very high level uh, stuff. So yes, refer to it, check it out, but it's not necessarily great. CCP14 website, there's loads of guides and tutorials on there. It's discontinued now, but the website is still there. So there's a lot of good help there. And also there's uh, something called the Rebelt mailing list, uh, an email list that you can sign up to and ask questions and get condescending answers from experts uh, if you want. Uh, books, I'm not going to dwell on this. Um, there's a book by Young called The Reap Belt Method. Uh, the first chapter is really good. I've never got beyond that. Um, there's a bunch of other things I'll refer to as we go through here um, that might be useful. And some papers as well. And again, if you get into Reap Belt, I'd recommend you read all the papers at least. So, we talked about a minute ago about 
good quality data. What, what does that mean? Uh, what, what do we need to consider when we're collecting data for rebuilt analysis? Well, firstly, we want good data. We try and come up with a, with a descriptor for what good means in diffraction data. It's pretty hard. Um, there's no sort of hard and fast rules, but we want ideally a powder sample. If you can't make a powder sample, it's not the end of the world. We'll come to that. But ideally, we want a well-ground powder sample. So by well-ground, we mean if you rub it between two fingers, it should feel soft. Um, not saying you necessarily do that. Um, but that's what you're looking for. You want crystallite sizes that are quite small. You want to get the particle size down, you know, so 1 to 20 microns, really. Anything bigger than that is going to impact on your data quality. So if you can grind your sample down without risking changing it, um, then do so. We need data over a wide angular range. We need high angle data um, for repro refinement. If we want to model the lattice parameters, we want to get accurate thermal parameters that we'll come on to talk about later. We need data collected to high angles. Okay, so you might run from 10 degrees to 80 degrees for your phase analysis, but for your rebuild, you're going to need to go maybe to 90 or 120 or, or whatever for your system. We want to use a small step size. Uh, and typically, people will use 0 0.02. Um, but what we actually want is a certain number of peaks that define the shape, a certain number of data points to define the shape of the peak. So if you don't have enough um, data points, obviously you're going to be doing a bit of a dot to dot as you go around trying to model the peak shape. Um, and so what we want above this thing called full width half maximum, so above half height on the peak, we want between 5 and 10 data points in that region. Okay. So if you look at your data and you think, you know, there's my data points, I've only got three data points in the top half of the peak, you need a smaller step size. Similarly, if you've got really big, broad peaks, you might want a bigger step size. We'll come on to why that is. Uh, how long to collect data is a, is a classic question. How long should I collect for rebelt? Long enough to get good data. Probably longer than you might do for phase analysis, but we don't want to over collect. We don't want to get intensities that are too high because then the background will become really flat and that can have a negative impact on the statistics that we'll see later. Um, so the statistical analyses will be skewed by having too good a background. You want a little bit of noise in the data. So if you're getting you know, 5,000 counts, 10,000 counts on your biggest peak, it's probably in the right ballpark. Thing, other things to consider if you're using Bragg-Brentano machines, so like the D2, the Siemens D5000s, um, does the machine have a secondary beam monochromator? Uh, all our D5000s do, the D2 doesn't. Uh, if it doesn't, then fluorescence might be an issue. You know, if you've got iron, cobalt, manganese in your sample, you need to consider that. Some of our machines now have these automated divergence slits, so we can change the slit size during the experiment um, to keep the illuminated area the same. I would recommend you don't use those for uh, repo refinement. Have fixed divergence slits like on the DDU. We want a sample ideally that's infinitely thick. We don't want our beam to penetrate through the sample. Uh, and we don't want to overspill onto the sample holder at low angles. So the divi divergence slits need to be small enough that all of the beam is falling on the sample at all angles. That's kind of a key one. Um, as I say, what do we mean by good quality data? There's not much more I can say about it, really. Um, there's no definite answer, but we want good peak shapes good, nice backgrounds, um, we want a good signal to noise ratio, and we want to be able to see all of the smaller reflections. So if something's there at 1% you know, relative intensity, we want to be able to see that. You don't want things getting lost in the background. Generally, noise is bad. If the peaks look noisy, you want better data. Okay, so an example here, different quality diffraction data sets. Um, <coughs> In blue, we have a sample that was collected at 12 degrees per minute. You can see the data is quite noisy, so straight away that's a bad sign. Uh, we can also see there are some peaks, uh, like here, there's this little lump in the background. Is that a peak? Is it not a peak? You can see when the data collected at a much slower speed, 0.15 degrees per minute, you can see that that's flattened out. So we don't want that kind of ambiguity. That's, that's what we're looking to avoid. We're on Questions of is it a peak, is it not a peak, big problem in rebuild. So this is what we're looking for, much better quality data. 
Uh, the other thing to bear in mind is called preferred orientation. So a lot of, if you're doing any sort of analysis on diffraction data really, it's going to assume that you've got a random orientation of crystals, uh, random, um, a random infinite number of crystallites within your sample. So we need to A, get the number of crystallites within the sample up as high as possible. Um, but we also want to avoid non-random distributions. So you'll recognize this from how we prepare our samples in the lab. If you're using the D2 or the D5000s, if they ever get back into action. Um, what we do, we fill up our sample holder, then we take a glass slide, drag it across, push it down a bit maybe. So if you've got particles in your sample that are platelet shaped or needle shaped, what you're going to do is encourage those to align in the direction that you're pushing. So if you push down, smear in one direction, those particles are going to align in that direction. So that means that the planes and the atomic structure parallel to the surfaces are also going to be aligned in that direction preferentially. And so we're going to see those more than we should do when we come to a look at our data. So those peaks will be bigger because we've seen more of those planes. Planes that run in perpendicular to the surface we won't see in our diffraction patterns and so they'll be smaller than they should be. And so that's going to skew the intensities in our peaks. And that's a big problem. Probably present for most samples, um, but for some samples, if you do have that non-isotropic particle shape, it's going to be a really big problem. So if you've got needles, if you've got um, platelets, you're going to need to think about how you collect your data. So uh, you might run in a capillary, for example. That's a really good way of avoiding that problem. Also, the, the new panelitical has backfilled sample holders, so you fill from the rear, so you don't have that interaction with the surface. And so they generally are better to start with anyway. Uh, I said about particle size as well. We want to reduce that as much as possible. This is from the David text that I recommended. And so what they were doing here, they were looking at a single reflection from a quartz sample, 113 peak, using copper radiation. And they made samples with a bunch of different crystallite sizes and just ran them exactly the same diffraction experiment again and again. What they saw was if the particle size was between 15 and 20 microns, which we would probably think is a pretty good sample, a, a good surround, um, they found the peak intensity varied by 18%. So running it once, running it again, the peak intensity might vary by 18%. If you're doing something that's modeling peak intensities, you can imagine that sort of irreproducibility could be a big problem. If they get it down, so or a broader range, so it's got some smaller but some bigger particles, 5 to 50, that dropped to 10. 5 to 15 microns, the peak intensities are much more reproducible, so the window of the peak intensities is getting much smaller. And if they get the particle size down below 5 microns, the reproducibility is really good. So again, grind up your samples. Make sure the samples, if they're powders, are as well ground as can be. Also, in terms of intensities, particle size has a big effect. If we've got 40 micron um, particles, this I think is for, I think I recalculated this for the D2 sample holders. So if you've got a 40 micron particle size in your sample, you fill up the D2 sample holder, you'll have around about 600,000 crystallites within that volume in the, in the sample holder, which sounds a lot. But the number that will be meeting the Bragg condition, any one angle, will be 12. So you've got 12 crystallites contributing to all of the diffraction. Probably the x-rays are only penetrating into the surface of those crystallites. Probably penetration depths will be 10 microns or so in many samples. And so you can imagine that's not a situation that's going to give you good intensities. You've got very few crystallites contributing, um, and it, it is very inefficient. If we reduce this particle size down to 10 microns, we've got a lot more crystallites in our sample holder, well it's at 38 million I guess, um, of which 760 will be diffracting. So you've got more crystallites diffracting, you'll get bigger peaks in your diffraction data. Get it down to 1 micron, we've now got a huge number of crystallites, 38,000 diffracting. So if you're looking at your data and you think, it's I mean, I've collected this overnight or if it's had a long exposure, the data is still really noisy, try grinding it up more. That's a big advantage. You can see a real example of this on the website as well, someone contributed. Uh, it makes a huge difference. So if you've got powder samples, 
really do make sure they're well ground. It makes a big, big difference. Okay, see another example here. Poorly ground uh, powder, no rotation. So what we can see, the red dots are the data points for the observed, the, the observed collected data from a diffractometer. The blue line is where they're trying to fit the correct crystal structure to those data. And what you can see is some peaks are much bigger in the observed data than they should be. Big, big problems. So again, just to reinforce, <coughs> make sure your samples are really well ground and uh, rotate the samples where possible to give that boost to the intensities as well. All data obviously will contain errors. There will be some errors in any data set that you can collect with any experimental technique. So we need to deal with these. One thing people are often tempted to do is to smooth the data. You often get an option, PDF4 software will give you an option to smooth the data. I don't like it because it introduces point-to-point -point correlation, so you're taking an average. Each data point becomes an average with its neighbours. So we certainly mustn't do that for rebuild. We can consider calibrating the data though, with various different standards that we can use. I've just ordered some more uh, silicon, so the NIST SRM will actually become 640E in our lab. But this is a material where we know exactly what the lattice parameter of that material is. So we can run the standard on the machine, see where the peaks are. We know where they should be, because we know what the lattice parameter should be. So we can then correct our data using an algorithm created from that difference. So we might use silicon, we might use mica if we've got particularly low angle reflections. Um, it doesn't matter as long as you know exactly what the lattice parameter is. You can do an external standard, even better if you can do an internal standard. Mix the silicon in with your sample and then you can cor correct it for that actual data set. And obviously we need to get it into the, the GSAS format. We need the data in the right format. We can do that in WinX POW if anyone still uses that, POW, D POW DLL and convex as well. I'm not going to dwell too much on instrument parameter files. To do a refinement in GSAS we need one of these IPRs, instrument parameter file. And this instrument parameter file tells GSAS how an instrument is set up, what sort of shape the peaks should have for an ideal standard sample. We can't do a refinement without one. Uh, if we have a bad instrument parameter file you'll struggle to do a refinement as well. Uh, whoever is responsible for the machine should be able to give you one of these. So if you're using our machines, go onto the lab website on MOL, you'll find under the machines, each machine has its own folder, and there will be an instrument parameter file for GSAS for, you, for, for that machine. If there isn't, let me know and I'll put one there. Um, if you go to a central facility, if you go to collect neutron data, at ISIS or synchrotron data, at Diamond or anything like that, you should be able to get an instrument parameter file from the beamline scientist. But don't assume that it's going to be any good. Don't assume that they care about instrument parameter files. And we'll come back to cover this later in more depth. Okay, so that's the first talk. I'm going to move on straight away to the second talk. Um, and then you guys will get hands on with the software. Any questions <coughs> at this point? Whitney, have we had any questions in the, the software? Oh. Pole figures, no. Um, we can model. Ask it in the software, then we can record it. <laughs> um, are you using the software? If you're not using the software, ask the question. Uh, so, pole figures, no, not for. Um, well, Whitney's given a much better answer than I can, so read Whitney's answer. Um, should we run a scan with D2 every time we collect our data? <coughs> yes, absolutely. There we go. Yes. So that's. Oh, I can't scroll down. I haven't got a window to scroll down. Whitney can type in what yes. Um, so, yes, we should. So the errors will be different. If you come on a different day, the temperature of the room will be different. The temperature of the cooling water in the machine might be different. The position of the x-ray line might vary as a result. Um, you might have prepared the sample differently. It might have a slightly different height. The machine might have been recalibrated. Alignment might be different for all sorts of reasons. Um, if you're collecting data for a rebuilt analysis, the 
standard should be run on the date ideally in the sample mixed in with it if the peak overlap isn't going to be problematic otherwise um, it should be run immediately before uh, so you run the standard then run the sample but as I say um, Sure. Yeah. Yeah. So the the yeah exactly. You only need to run a standard if you want to get accurate lattice parameters. Uh, I would say uh, that's that's the key thing. If you want accurate lattice parameters, you need a standard for the peak positions. Uh, why do we use the term reflection? Because it's reflections off of a lattice plane that we're considering. It's purely analogous. It doesn't really work like that. There's no such thing as lattice planes um, in real life. But that's the analogy that Bragg's law works on so that's why we use reflection okay good good oh we've got a confusion slide as well I'll come back to that so some interactive things now to wake you all up uh, if you're going to collect data for readout analysis in GSAS which of these things might you need there are more than one correct answer there is more than one correct answer So yeah, you click all your answers you think are correct, and um, then pre don't forget to press submit. Someone change their mind. <coughs> so options: an instrument parameter file, a powder specimen, data collected to a specific angle, uh, to increase data collection times data collected to high angles or to use a specific machine let's see what we've got see how bad it is okay good interesting so um, if I press close will it show us it won't show us the right answers okay so the correct answers were a you will need an instrument parameter file so most of you got that right a powder specimen no you don't need to it's ideal uh, powder specimens are better um, not uh, I'm dissing metallurgy in general but a powder specimen is the ideal if you don't have a powder specimen you can still do read belt that's not a problem data collected to a specific angle no we don't need that at all C is wrong D to increase co data collection times absolutely that is something you might need to consider um, so it's interesting most of you didn't click that D is something you very much might need to consider an hour or 10 minutes on the D2 or you know half an hour on the expert might be fine for phase analysis but you might need an hour you might need to go a bit longer um, on the D2 uh, data collected to high angles yes again um, you'll need high angles as we'll see later for uh, accurate lattice parameters thermal parameters and good to use a specific machine no you can do read belt with data collected on any machine uh, by and large so the correct answers were A, D, and E. Okay. Uh, if you want to collect data for read part analysis, is the particle size in your sample important? And if so, what size should you aim for? As small as possible, less than 50, less than 250 microns, crystallite size is not important. One of, the one of these days they're going to put in a little countdown thing so that it plays the countdown music when you press it. As small as possible, spot on. Um, obviously if you're grinding your sample, if you're grinding the powder up, you might be putting heat into the sample and might cause some chemical changes. So or it might cause contamination with your milling media. So we need to be considerate of, of that possibility. So we, um, we can't really say, right, I'm going to go out and get a one micron powder. It might not be possible. For me, this question is very confusing because particle for me is not the same as crystallite. No, that's, that's true. Um, what we're measuring in diffraction is crystallite size. Yeah, so, so crystallite could be the smallest coherently scattering domain. So the particle could be any size, yeah. but the crystallite should be as small as possible. So yeah, if, you, if you've got agglomeration, we want to try and break that up. But yeah, what we're what we're looking at is in diffraction, it's not 
the, the particle, it's the, it could be a domain within a crystallite even. Yeah, exactly. um, but yeah, if we grind our samples up, we're going to decrease all of those things, hopefully. So the point is, is the question is, should be, is the crystallite side in your sample or not just the particle? Okay, <laughs> I will concede that point to you. <laughs> um, yeah, I had a guy yesterday come to me. Uh, and he said, oh, I've passed this powder through a 250 micron sieve. Oh, yay. <laughs> so what? It's not, it's, it's not really going to do anything for diffraction. If he passed it through like a 10 micron sieve, I might get excited. Um, but yeah, just do what you can to get the crystallite or particle size down. Uh, okay, so second talk. How applicable is read by modeling XRF data? Not at all. Um, XRF is a completely different technique so it's not going to help us at all in modeling XRF it wouldn't recognize XRF data we can't I can understand why you would ask that but no this is just for diffraction data x-ray diffraction neutron diffraction good um, so solving a crystal structure so we've, uh, we've kind of danced around the edges talked about thinking about Rietveld Let's start getting down to action. So we're going to look at theoretical models, refinable parameters, whatever that is, um, and how we start and monitor a refinement. Okay, so first of all, I mentioned this thing of a theoretical crystal structure, a theoretical model. What, what do I mean by that business? Well, <coughs> if we were to think back to what we said right at the start, in a refinement, we're going to take a theoretical model of a crystal structure, or more than one crystal structure, uh, we're going to then generate a calculated diffraction pattern from that and then we're going to allow the structural model, this thing we've come up with in step one, to vary in a controlled manner so that the calculated pattern more closely resembles the observed data. So the first thing we need therefore is going to be that starting theoretical model of the crystal structure. So what information do we need? As I said earlier, this can be a huge challenge. If you're looking at things that have been studied or analogous things that have been studied, um, great. You've got a really good starting point. Probably you can just go online and, and get things straight away. Otherwise, you know, you're going to have to come up with this information for yourself. And that can be tricky. What we need to know, space group. And for some space groups, they have more than one choice of origin. Don't worry too much about what space groups are. I'm not going to cover crystallography in this uh, course at all. But the space group basically defines the symmetry within the unit cell. So it tells us where the atoms can be uh, within that unit cell. So we need to know the space group, the lattice parameters. Obviously, you might be hoping to get lattice parameters out of this process. Uh, but we need to have the peaks roughly in the right place to start with. So we'll need to start an idea of what the lattice parameters might be. But that's something we can come up with on the fly a little bit. We can, as long as we're in the ballpark, we can, we can fudge it. But we need a starting point at least for those. We need to know, or we need an idea at least of the chemical formula, what the material is. Is it LiCO-MnO4? Is it Li2-MnO3? That kind of thing. And then from the space group, we'll need to know which crystallographic sites are filled, at least one to start with. Um, well that's the position of the atoms in terms of fractional coordinates, x, y, and z, where the atom is. Um, we only need to know for one, then the software can interpolate from the space group where all the other atoms will be. And we need to know how full those sites are. So if we've got a site, is it fully occupied by one atom? Is it occupied partially by different atoms? And so on. We'll come back to look at what that means. As I say, if you're going from this ab initio, you may not know all of this at the start. You might need to do electron diffraction to find out what the space group is. You might need to get uh, some basic refinements to find out what the lattice parameters are that kind of thing. But for, for what we're going to do today, and for most of the samples we look at these days, we'll be able to make at least a good guess for all of the parameters we need. So generally, most people will find this straightforward. Where might you go for help? Uh, well, check literature, um, look at papers, talk to your fellow researchers. Um, there are a bunch of databases as well. So the ICSD is probably the main one these days, the International Crystal Structure Database. Um, while we're here, uh, I don't know, once we've left the EU, maybe it'll be different, but at the moment we have free access to this. It's based in uh, Karlsruhe in Germany. 
and it's a big repository. Uh, I've not updated this slide for a couple of years. I would suspect it's a lot more than 120,000 entries now. Um, so lots of things that have been studied, reported previously. If I was to study a paper, a, a new material, publish a paper with the crystal structure in the ICSD would pick it up these days and, and tell me to submit the data to that database. So that's a huge repository of information, all the information you'd need. And from that, you can download a SIF file, crystallographic information file, which will have all the information you need. Um, so you can put that straight into GSAS, which is really handy. There are other ones. Cambridge CSD is more for organics and organometallics. NIST, a standard reference database I've never used, but that's another option. And also the ICDD uh, within PDF4 that we use for phase analysis. A bunch of those phases now have this information as well, pulled from the ICSD largely. So there's a bunch of things that you, a bunch of places you can get help and get information. What does this information look like? Well, we've got the crystal structure for strontium titanate here, and you can see this is all the information that we need um, to start our refinement. So we need to know the space group, so from strontium titanate, PM bar 3M. How we put the space group into the software is really important, and we'll see more examples of that later when you all get it wrong. Um, lattice parameter, so we've got a starting lattice parameter. You can often see the estimated standard deviation in brackets afterwards. We don't need that. We just need the 3.89. Probably 3.89 would be good enough for a starting point. Uh, that's all we need there. And then we need the atom position. So in strontium titanate, perovskite structure, so the titanium's on the body center. So half, half, half. The strontiums are on the corners of the unit cell in yellow here, zero, zero, zero and oxygen is on the face centers, so zero, half, half. We only need one position from the space group in those where all the equivalent positions are. And so it can bump those other atoms in and then start moving everything around. Uh, I got this data from the I ICSD. You can see the reference there. But that's all we need. Very basic information and readily available in most cases. So what are we going to refine? So we've got our starting model. What sort of things can we refine? Um, so there's a whole bunch of parameters here I'm not going to give them names at this stage as you go through the worked example you'll see lots of um, different parameters and they'll be fitting against these two things I've divided up the parameters pretty arbitrarily into two different lists so parameters for each individual phase within your sample and parameters for the overall refinement, the sort of kind of global parameters. So for each phase, as I say, we need to know lattice parameters, atomic positions, site occupancies, how occupied the sites are, and we might get this in a SIF file. Thermal parameters, a measure of uh, motion, how much the atom is vibrating around on that, on that crystallographic site. Um, scale factors, how big the peak should be. Phase fractions, how much of a phase you have and also things like preferred orientation crystallite size that kind of thing so I've color coded these and the red things are things that you need to know we need to deal with the blue things are things we're going to deal with in the refinement itself and then the purple things at the bottom are kind of optional so things you'll need to deal with if they're problems in your systems uh, in terms of global parameters obviously you need to know the wavelength of the radiation um, that we're using uh, we've got these Profile parameters, they tell us what the peak shape should be for an ideal sample. Uh, so we'll need these, we'll get these from the instrument parameter file. And then we've got things about zero point errors, specimen displacement, the height of the sample is wrong, we can refine that. We'll deal with the background during the refinement. And then things like absorption and transparency, uh, we might deal with as we go through the refinement if they're problematic as well. So it might look like there's a lot of things here um, that this is going to be um, a big challenge. Don't panic. Uh, we're going to look at these very carefully as we go through today. So we're going to take these in turn um, as we progress through the day. They're covered in depth in Young's book as well, um, but it's really not that daunting. So don't worry. Okay, so just to test you're all still awake at this stage, uh, which of these might you find in a SIF file, a crystallograph information file that you might download from the ICSD? Lattice parameters, Absorb atomic positions, space group, and thermal parameters. 
No, I don't. There is more than one correct answer. <coughs> I forget what the answer I set was. There should be. There is more than one right answer. So feel free to click multiple things. So the answer is actually all of them. Uh, you, you can get all of these from, someone clicked in there, well done. Um, you can get all of these from a SIF file. SIF files will often give you thermal parameters as well. Put it back, that's it. Um, so you need to be careful of that because the thermal parameter is more for your sample. So you can, you can take lattice parameters of atomic positions as groups from a SIF file, but I would not take the thermal parameters for a refinement. Okay, so starting a refinement. It's time you guys did some actual work rather than to listening to me. Let's have a look. Uh, two theta zero is uh, like dealing with misalignment in the machine. So if the zero point is set wrong on the machine, the machine needs to know what zero is, where zero is. And if that's been set wrong, obviously your peaks will be shifted as a result. So we can model that in the in the refinement. Uh, yes, we can do this for bulk. As I say, powder samples are ideal, but bulk samples are possible. We'll come to look at some examples of bulk materials later on. But yes, it's possible. Um, can be a um, it can be a big challenge that chemical composition. Um, we certainly had that in the past, and Rebelt can help you identify what the chemical composition is. If you look doing a phase diagram study and you've found a new phase, you don't know what it is, the Rebelt can give you supporting information to help you identify what the chemical composition is. But obviously, if you know the chemical composition, then you can keep the Rebelt on track. So it is a useful thing to know. But if you don't know it, it's not the end of the world. Uh, can Rebelt be performed in mixed phase products where only one of, yes it can. Uh, one of the examples we'll work on today is a multi-phase specimen, so you'll see that as, as we go. If you're, uh, uh, often if you're making a new material, um, it's never been studied before, the chances are you'll have some secondary phase there, you can just ignore secondary phases if you want. Uh, how do you specify in the analysis if you've used the diffraction data um, in the instrument parameter file? Yeah, specified in there. We'll come back to look at that later as well. For a complete mystery material, could you use XRD data to inform the starting point or would that influence the refinement? Um, I think if it was a complete mystery material, I'd probably be using something else first, like XRF to figure out what elements were in there. Um, so by that stage, it wouldn't be a complete mystery material. Um, I think s s you know, at the end of the day, any diffraction analysis is not going to be a black box technique. So you're going to need to put something in to start with at the very least. Um, so I would always, elemental information can be really, really important. But it might be that you don't know exactly what something is. You know, it might be that you've got some sort of perovskite that's got five different cations in it. Um, you could start off dealing with it as a model perovskite, strontium titanate, and then deal with it from there. Uh, more info on thermal parameters, you will get it as we go. Okay, so let's crack on with getting to the actual point of today. The two guys that were struggling, have you got TSUS running yet? You're running? Yeah, yeah. You're good. Okay, awesome. So we've all got GSAS running. So what we're going to be learning today is this program called GSAS and EXP GUI. As I say, GSAS is a horrible old DOS-based thing, so it's based around these menus where you have to know exactly the right key to press at every point. Um, it's a really complex um, program. It's horrible to use, um, and it can model multi-phase mixtures of up to nine different phases. So that's great. Um, that's lovely, but we don't really want to use it because it's, it takes forever and it's really hard to learn. EXP GUI 
is a graphical user interface for a GSAS. So it's running all the same programs in the background. It's running exactly the same thing, but it uses a more modern user interface and kind of Windows-based interface that we're all used to. Uh, you can do probably all of the things you would ever need to do, bar a couple of things. You might have to delve into GSAS. Um, but the majority of things these days you can do in EXP GUI without ever having to touch GSAS under the hood. So G EXP GUI uh, looks like this once you get into it. So we've got this window. Uh, along the top we've got menus uh, which you can use to access all of the different programs within GSAS. You've then got this kind of weird I never quite know, yellowy, beigey, kind of nondescript color with these one, two, three, four, five, six, seven buttons. Exp Nam, Exp Edit, Gen Les, Pow Pref, Pow Plot, Oobles View, and Live Plot. Uh, these are the most commonly run programs in this toolbar. So these are the things you're going to be running all the time. Um, just going to be running those on repeat a lot. So those are the things you're going to be pressing quite often. In red, I've highlighted Genlez and PowerPref and LivePlot. Those three in particular you'll be running all the time. So that's where to find them. And then down below here, we've got all these tabs, LS controls, phase, histogram, scaling, profile, and so on. And these are where we enter our information, like the parameters that we're refining, the crystal structures, all of that. So if you want to put in information about a phase or change, change information about a phase, you do it in the phase tab. If you want this, on some people sometimes it changes to powder instead of histogram, um, but in histogram or powder, this is where we put the data that we're going to be using in the refinement. Uh, so more on that as we go. So what we're going to do now is we're going to work on a repo refinement for a set of XRD data collected from a sample of Yttria, Y203. So what we're going to need well, first of all, we're going to have to load EXP GUI. We're going to have to insert a new phase, the, the crystal structure information, the theoretical model for Y203. We're then going to load a histogram, which is fancy name for a data. I don't know why suddenly we have to have a name, uh, but we can just call it data. Um, but at this stage, we call it a histogram. And then we're going to start refining. You've got instructions for how to do this uh, in the email that I sent last week and again yesterday. And these guide you through, step by step, what to do in this refinement. So we're going to start off by refining something called the scale factor. Then we're going to add in the background as well. Then we're going to add in the lattice parameters, let the peak shapes vary. Then we're going to add in the specimen displacement to correct for the height of the sample being wrong during the data collection. So you can see it's an iterative process. We constantly increase the complexity in the refinement one parameter at a time. So that's why it's controlled. We're only allowing one extra thing to vary at each stage. Let me just check. Okay, we're going to come to that. Good. So in terms of progression, what do I mean when I say refine, not refine? I don't know if on the last slide. Okay, so down here, there is. it says here, extract f ofs. Don't worry about what that means. You can see at the moment it doesn't have a tick in. This is a refinement flag box. So if I wanted to do that, I would click on that little box and then it would do it in the next cycle. So in this example, if I want to refine the cell parameters, there's a box called refine cell. This is when the flag is off. This is when I've clicked it to say the flag is on. If it's ticked during the next cycle of refinement, that thing is going to vary. It's going to allow that parameter to change so that the data is modeled more uh, appropriately. So we set the flag, so we tick the box that we want. The instructions will guide you as to what boxes to tick. Uh, and once you've ticked the box, we generally run two programs, PowPref, which gets everything ready for refinement, tidies up everything, says where the peak should be. And that's very quick. And then we run Genles, this or Genels as I used to call it. And this is the least squares refinement program. So Genles allows the parameters to vary. So that's what lets things change. That's our refinement process. When you run Genlez, you get a DOS output that looks like this. By default, it will run three cycles of refinement. So it'll allow the parameters to vary, feed them back in, it'll let them vary a bit more. 
feed them back in and then I'll let things vary a bit more and then I'll kick out this input at the bottom. So what we've got here, I've cir circled in red, uh, are some statistics. We've got these WRP or and RP values for the full fit and minus the background. So we keep an eye on those. We've got another thing that we call chi-squared, which we keep an eye on. Don't worry about the terms. Once you've done the refinement, we're going to come back and go through exactly what all these things mean. And then at the bottom, we've got two things that are interesting. Final variable sum, you can see here is zero. If the refinement is working, this number should get smaller. And when it's zero, it means nothing's changed. The refinement is finished for this stage. And below that, what we're looking for every time, this word or this phrase, convergence was achieved. That means nothing's changing. Everything's happy. That's what we're looking for. As I say, the instructions are going to talk you through this in really close detail. So don't panic if this doesn't make sense at the moment. So what you have, you've got a copy of the instructions. I'm going to go through those on the iPad in a second. We've got two folders. So with this worked example one, we're using the data that is in the folder WE1 that I emailed you. You want to put that on your computer. So, the WE1 folder, if you're working on your own laptop, put it where you want. You want to be able to find it. So I would recommend going C slash GSAS slash um, WE1, something like that. As I say, as long as you know where it is, it doesn't matter. If you're on the managed desktop, you'll need to be on the U drive with that folder. The only one you'll be able to say when you know the So again, U G S W E one. So that's how it should look. So copy that folder to those directories. Your own laptop, C drive, manage desktop, U drive. Make sure you know where the data is done. Because obviously we're going to need to tell the software where the data is. Within that folder, you've got within both of those folders, you've got two files. One is the instrument parameter file, one is the data file. Okay. After that, you follow the instructions. Really simple. Um, it gives you a step-by-step -step guide. It will talk you through the whole process of the refinement, right from the start. Um, these I've given this workshop like six or seven times, about once a year for the last few years, once or twice a year for the last few years. Um, so they've had a good going through with people struggling and uh, they've been tidied up a lot. So they should be really nailed on now. So literally everything, just read the text, do what it tells you. If the text is in italics, it's extra information. You can skip it, you can read it later, or you can read it now, it's up to you. If text is in bold, it's something that you have to do. A button to press in the software, something to click, something to run. If it's in a green box, that means that it's an instruction for worked example to that we're going to do this afternoon. Somewhere where the instructions are different, you need to do something different to what you do in works example one. Uh, as I say, you, you want to work on this on your own really, um, but do talk to your neighbours, do talk to the people around you and see how they're getting on, share progress, you know, discuss what's happening. If you've got a problem, someone next to you is already further ahead, you'll get used to seeing where people are in the instructions. Um, so if they're on step six and you're stuck at step five, Ask them for help.